Good morning. Good morning, distinguished uh, members of the panel and audience. I'm, uh, I'm glad to share this panel with the key personalities coming from the national government, the National Assembly, the private sector, and, the, and from the academia. Um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, the panel that we have this morning. We have uh, the Honorable Rohan Sinan. He was the CEO of a large and dynamic holdings company involved in diverse areas such as finance, insurance, real estate, and the food industry. His successful career in business did not limit his passion for helping people, and this led him into a life of politics where he became a long-standing member of the People's National Movement. He first entered Parliament as a temporary senator. He was appointed as government senator and later he was appointed as Minister of Works and Transport. He's also a member of the Joint Select Committee of Parliament for Social, for Social Services and Public Administration. We also have with us Honorable Kelvin Charles, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly. He has a bachelor's degree in sociology and management and an executive MBA specializing in finance and, and entrepreneurship from the Arthur Block Jack Graduate School of Business. A political activist since a young age, he has held various positions in his party group and the Tobago West constituency. He has functioned as elections officer, education officer, and later has assumed the roles of the research officer and education officer of the executive of the Tobago Council of the People's National Movement. Later, at the end of the PNM internal elections, he rose to the position of political leader of the Tobago PNM. Also is with us, Ms. Gillian Gola, CEO of the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. She was the Vice President of Business Development at the Trinidad and Tobago International Financial Center, where she played a central role in the establishment of the financial services outsourcing industry in Trinidad and Tobago. Previously, she served as Chief Operating Officer of Development Finance Limited after gaining substantial experience in credit operations private equity, grant management, and microfinance at executive and board levels. And also is with us, sharing this panel, Professor John Egger, Professor of the Department of Life Science of the University of the University of West Indies. He's a marine biologist and a professor of tropical island ecology. His current research interest is in the field of sustainable, of sustainable science, including development of the blue and circular economy model for islands. He is the Small Islands Chapter Review Editor of the Sixth Assessment of the UN Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Of climate change. He is coordinated lead author of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Global Assessment. He has also served as Chairman of the Environmental Management Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. He is the Director of the University of the West Indies San Agustin Center for innovation and entrepreneurship. Developing a blue economy for a resilient future is not only the title of this session, but also is a paramount challenge, especially for the Caribbean region and of course for Trinidad and Tobago. This morning, we'll seek to address important questions among, among them the following. You know, because of the broader sense and the broader scope of the blue economy, we're gonna have these three questions as a guidelines, and every member of the panel is gonna develop for about 10 or up to 15 minutes, his remarks, his insights. And then we're gonna, uh, if uh, according to avail uh, available time, we're gonna go to one or two additional rounds, rounds of Q&A uh, Q according how develops the, this development of, of, of the theme. These three, quest uh, these three questions which are gonna be the guidelines for the first round are, are, are as follows. First, how can waterfront cities and towns optimize the opportunities offered by the blue economy? How does the governance of coastal regions and ecosystems respond to the challenges of communities dependent on the blue economy? And the third one, how should coastal cities restructure their public ex expenditures and investments to fully harness the potential of the blue economy. So we're going to start giving the floor in the first place to honor our, to honor our Minister Sinanen, who will have up to 15 minutes 
to present the main lines of action of his office in undertaking to build a resilient, a resilient blue economy. Uh, thank you. Let me just acknowledge the Vice President of CAF this morning. Welcome to Trinidad. Let me also acknowledge the Minister of Finance, the Governor of the Central Bank, and also my permanent secretary uh, from the Ministry of Works and Transport. And I also want to take this time to thank the organizers for actually having me present to a, a wonderful and distinguished audience as present here today. Now, I represent the Ministry of Works and Transport and coming into office in 2015, this government would have uh, campaigned on basically a manifesto which became government policy and that morphed into a Vision 2030 document. In that 2030 document, uh, Goal 3 and Goal 5 were basically assigned uh, where the Ministry of Works and Transport would have had significant input. And Goal 3 deals with the, the climate vulnerability and, and Goal 5 maximize, maximizing our natural resources. Now, these two areas basically fall smack into the blue economy. And I say that because coming into office and sitting with the staff, we recognize that the major challenge facing this country as an island in terms of the infrastructure would have been one, because of the climate change and what is actually happening with the weather pattern is flooding and coastal erosion. We identified those two areas as the two most critical areas facing us as a country and from the Ministry of Works and Transport, because we deal with the infrastructure. Yes, we have highways. Yes, we have uh, walkovers. We have se several projects. But when we saw what was happening with coastal erosion around Trinidad and Tobago, we recognized that something had to be done about that. In terms of the flooding problems, what we saw over the last couple of years was intensified flooding. And that continues because the, 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 the global warming, some people may think it's not that, but we feel that there's a drastic change in the weather pattern. And what we have seen in Trinidad as a small island is areas that flooding never occurred. We have significant flooding happening. That water has to get down to the ocean. And it is helping with the destruction of the coastal areas. So you have the pounding from the ocean with the rise in the sea level, and then you have the flooding that is taking place. What we set about to do about that, we designed a coastal program, which took into consideration a study of the entire coast, because we have to tie this into a program where we can protect the environment, protect the coastlines, but at the same time, we have to use the benefit of that to assist with the Minister of Finance, because the Minister of Finance always complained to me that the Ministry of Works utilize all the money in the budget. And what we set out to do is to look at two areas. One, how the areas under the Ministry of Works and Transport could contribute to the economy. And the second area is whenever CAF lends us money, we could utilize that money and bring some sort of benefit back for the economy and to help the, the Minister of Finance repay CAF. So what we set out to do is to create policies and programs that we will we'd benefit both ways. So in terms of our coastal protection programs, we design programs that not only protect the coast, but where tourism could benefit from. And one of these projects is a simple project on the East Coast, where we started off 
with a revetment wall. We were able to convert that revetment wall with just a 10% increase in the cost of the budget to a boardwalk. And as we speak, that have morphed into a tourist project. Because on that coast, we have a lot of natural resources and areas that if the infrastructure was not there, we would not recognize that you could attract tourists in an area like that. So we set about to identify these projects and utilize them, just not simple infrastructure projects, but create them into projects that we could grow the tourist industry. And we have, as we speak, 11 projects around the island, all geared to protecting the environment, but also trying to create a new economy for the coastline communities. And I can tell you the, the citizens in those areas, they are very happy with that because it's, a, it's an entire new uh, development for them. They're taking full advantage of, of these projects. And I'm really happy to see uh, you, you're actually creating a new set of businessmen in, in, in those areas. What we also look at at the ministry is how we could contribute to the, 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 the economy by using the marine sector. If we are to, to maximize on the natural resources, a major natural resource we have is the water. Unfortunately, as a country, uh, we never utilize and take full advantage of our location. And the fact that we are perfectly placed away from the, 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 the hurricane belt. What we decided in 2017, we went to the cabinet with a note to basically um, take charge of the marine environment. We had a lot of uh, people coming in and packing the, the drill ships and so out in the ocean there. And we were not collecting anything for that. What we decided to do as a cabinet and as a government is to rearrange that whole maritime sector. We actually, redesign the areas that we were going to allow these uh, coal stacking to take place. And I must say, we have developed a whole industry out there, very organized, ensuring that the environment is protected and utilizing the different agencies, the state agencies, to ensure that we stick to, to what is best practice guidelines and I am happy to say that we have collected a significant amount of revenue to allow the Minister of Finance to continue borrowing to assist us going forward. This was an industry that we never, we never capitalize on. But as Minister of Works and Transport, I just did not want to keep de depending on the Ministry of Finance. There were several areas that we could have uh, developed. In terms of the port facilities, as we speak, the ministry, we are uh, at the cost of uh, turning the sod for Port in Maruga. Again, an area where the fishing industry never had the, the facilities to grow. We are about to turn the sod for a new fishing port in Maruga, designed in such a way that what will happen, we will create the atmosphere where business could flourish and Again, tourism, because we talk about designing these, 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 these marinas, these ports, fishing facilities, where when tourists come into the island, they go into these remote areas and they see a different culture. So we're actually trying to tie the development with tourism in some of these remote areas that have so much to offer, but nobody ever actually went in and see how we could tie the development of the area with the economy. We have, as we speak, the, the Galiota port going into a phase, phase two. What that means is that the entire eastern seaboard up there will be developed using the marine uh, resources in that area. We also have another major port in Toko. A major port in Toko will enhance 50% of the landmass in, in this country, because we have a challenge where 50% of the landmass on the 
uh, Eastern Seaboard does not have that sort of infrastructure. We're putting in now infrastructure there through the Ministry of Works in terms of a highway program. But we need to do something there that could create employment. The North Coast is noted for being the closest point to Tobago. If we put in a passenger terminal there, a marine passenger terminal, we will cut the time between Trinidad and Tobago by, uh, it's just about 30%, it's one third the distance from Port of Spain to Tobago. Again, what you will create down there is an entire um, commerce and trade developing in that area where, I mean, you have so much of people, no employment, beautiful tourist facilities. Some of the best uh, scenic views in Trinidad is on the East Coast, but nobody takes advantage of it. What we're trying to do is the blue economy, because a lot of people are asking me, what is the blue economy? A lot of us talk about the blue economy, but we really don't understand what it is. It's technically tying the marine resources to the economy of the country and how we actually utilize the natural resources that we have, in this case, the marine resources to develop and help to develop the economy in a much more um, viable way. So the Ministry of Works, we do have several projects ongoing. We take this blue economy very seriously because we look in terms of 15, 20 years down the road, if we don't deal with the coastal problems, if we don't deal with flooding, we will have a major problem in this country. But it's not just about fixing that problem. It's about how we could maximize the, these projects in terms of sustainability going forward as a country. So having said that, I would pass back to the moderator and be prepared to answer any questions that the, the audience or the panel may have. Thank you much for your uh, insights, uh, Honorable Minister. Yes, indeed. I mean, uh, Trinidad Tobago made a remarkable progress in these two areas. Uh, blue economy, the blue economy um, has uh, uh, two main drivers. One is uh, fisheries and another one is tourism, pretty much recognized in the Caribbean region. Um, blue economy underpins threats so the, um, to sustainable economic benefits. Uh, from marine resources uh, areas. At the same time, these these threats are widely recognized. First, the uh, habitat, the habitat degradation and, and ecosystem modification, um, which is key. I mean, which plays a key role when we talk about tourism. The second one is also recognized as uh, as uh, unsustainable fisheries, in which, for example, in the Caribbean region, we recognize that in the last ten years. Uh, probably the 40% of the fishing capacity has been lost. And the third one is pollution, in which the, the, the forecasts uh, are telling us that by, 20, by, that by 2050, I mean, we're gonna have as much plastic as the biomass in the, in the sea. So there's a, uh, quite a challenge uh, behind us, uh, I mean, before us, and uh, all this progress that Trinidad and Tobago is, I mean, is making, I think it's gonna be Key, I mean, and key factors in order to, mm -hmm. to deal and overcome these, these threats. Then uh, uh, we're going to give the floor to, honorable, uh, to the Honorable Charles, so also he can share with, uh, with us his insights. Please have the floor. Thank you very much, moderator. I also want to begin by recognizing the Honorable Minister of Finance. My apologies. <laughs> so let me begin by recognizing uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance, um, the very distinguished and erudite um, Colin Imbel, uh, my colleague in the part of the government arrangement, but of course he's at the central government level and I'm at the Tobago House of Assembly level. Um, Mr. Joel Jack, Deputy Chief Secretary is here. Um, the 
president of the uh, CAF Bank, uh, members of the diplomatic corps, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I, I begin by quickly providing a context for you in respect of how the Tobago House of Assembly fits into the governance arrangement in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, the Tobago House of Assembly was recreated, and I'm saying recreated because prior to our annexation to Trinidad um, in 1889, we were an island that managed its own affairs. So Act 37 of 1980 recreated the Tobago House of Assembly, but it was essentially an institution slightly above that of a county council in Trinidad. In fact, the chairman of the Tobago House of Assembly, as he was then called, was the only full-time employee at the political level. Um, Act 40 of 1996 created a fundamental shift in the um, governance arrangements in Tobago. Um, we had, for the first time, in a sense, um, a single chamber a legislature. And you had an executive headed by a chief secretary with other secretaries and a legislature headed by the presiding officer. Part of the funding arrangement required uh, the intervention of a dispute resolution commission report, which um, advised that Tobago House of Assembly should receive no less than 4.03 and no more than 6.9% of the national budget. So that represents, in a very real sense, the kind of funding arrangement um, for the Tobago House of Assembly. Now, over the years, we have um, been provided with funding at the lower level of that scale. And listening to um, the Honorable Minister of, of Works and Transport, I understand why. Because he did say that Ministry of Works spent all the money <laughs> <laughs> and, and places. <laughs> and more. The Tobago House of Assembly is basically responsible under the fifth schedule for about 33 areas of governance. And that includes tourism, infrastructure, um, health, um, fisheries, uh, culture, community development, etc. We are not responsible for areas under the purview of the central government. So the president, um, immigration, foreign affairs, national security are some examples. Now, having um, said that, the administration that I lead came to office in 2017, in late January 2017. And as you would have heard from the, Ministry of the Minister of Finance presentation, that was a time where there was a precipitous decline in the revenue base of Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, Tobago House of Assembly was impacted as well. As a matter of, of fact, in 2017, the Tobago House of Assembly, by way of um, funding or transfers from the Treasury, received $450 million approximately less than the year before. So you can understand the context in which we had to operate. I can add as well that out of that arrangement, we had some um, back pay arrangements to pay to workers of the Tobago Regional Health Authority. And therefore, that also would have been funding for God that we could not have used. That is the context against which we were operating. In 2018, the allocation from Parliament was more or less the same level as 2012, six years earlier. That notwithstanding, for personal costs, for example, we had to spend an additional $200 million just to maintain our staffing arrangements. And may I add that um, we do have some structural issues in our economy in Tobago, because at this time, approximately six out of every 10 persons employed are employed directly by the Tobago House of Assembly. And two out of the other four um, are employed indirectly, but by entities that are organized to provide services directly to the THA. So you begin to understand that 
situation. And that's the context in which we decided that as part of changing the status quo, we had to do a number of things. One, we decided that in the short term, we would seek to revitalize our tourism industry. And we are hearing about the blue economy, but for us, um, we had always been engaged in activities critical or aligned to the blue economy, given the fact that the blue economy, by definition, speaks to um, how we exploit the resources of the oceans, and at the same time, ensuring um, sustainability yeah. and taking, issue, taking care of issues that threaten that environment. So we had always been involved in that. In the Tobago, we can talk about the, um, the reefs that we have, the famous Boko Reef, for example, or an island pool. We had always used those as selling points, but now we're going a bit further. Um, we have other reefs um, around Tobago in Speyside and, and Charlottesville. We are emphasizing our dive industry um, as part of utilizing all our assets to facilitate and increase in our tourism, international tourism arrivals and so on. So that tourism continues to play a major part in the development of the island's economy in the short term. Uh, we, at this point, are uh, having exploratory conversations with um, potential investors in respect of the development of a dedicated cruise ship port in Tobago. Again, seeking to maximize opportunities under the, blue, the rubric of the blue economy. I can say that the Ministry of Finance is currently evaluating and working on proposals for the construction of a marina in southwestern um, Tobago as part of that same kind of thrust to improve that, um, that, that avenue of our developmental um, arrangements. Fisheries is another area in which we continue to um, utilize, both for um, our local consumption and to a lesser extent um, export. I can say that we have taken the decision where we will engage um, a Caribbean company to do an assessment of our fishing stock as a measure or as a means towards ensuring that there is sustainability in the exploitation and conservation of our fishing um, stock as in the area of that. Now, because the development of the blue economy also requires um, sustainable management and therefore the threat of pollution is real, we would have organized or rebranded our divisions in a way that provide a certain kind of emphasis and focus on these things. So for example, the division of infrastructure and public utilities as it then was, when we came to office, we rebranded that the division of infrastructure, quarries and the environment. And so far, we have established a coastal zone management unit in that division designed to um, treat with policy issues as well as uh, implementation issues to manage our coastal um, erosion is situation. Tobago, as you know, um, is 116 square miles in area basically 27 miles long and seven and a half miles wide at its widest point. So that in a very real sense, Tobago is extremely vulnerable to climate change and rising sea levels. And we have in fact been impacted very significantly. One of our more famous beaches, um, Pigeon Point, our real space for tourism, um, relaxation, and leisure has been severely impacted. And uh, an initial assessment suggests that 
it will take about three to four years, facilitated, of course, by the relevant um, feasibility studies to fully rehabilitate that area. It is in that context that we are happy to um, be associated with this conference and the fact that we are currently engaging CAF through the Ministry of Finance for supplementary funding to assist us in our coastal development and protection strategy. Because initial estimates alone to rehabilitate um, Pigeon Point is approximately 50 million TT dollars. And that's one. Um, a while ago when I spoke about our tourism thrust and effort, Little Tobago is an area of tremendous potential for our tourism industry. However, the jetty that is there that facilitates transportation arrangements um, has been around for decades and is showing tremendous signs of disrepair. And what is required, therefore, is a reconstruction of that jetty. That, again, is estimated at in excess of about $15 million. Um, Charlotteville has a jetty that has to be rehabilitated because it does, at this time, facilitate the smaller cruise ships that would take a couple million dollars as well. Palo Tavir Jetty, which is key to our fishing industry, the jetty is all about collapse. And that has been, I think it's about $20 million to treat with that. So that Tobago is severely impacted, has been severely impacted. Financing is a challenge, as I would have just outlined. And to the extent that we can be facilitated by additional sources of funding, including private sector funding, to that extent, we would be appreciative. And to that extent, we are trying to encourage um, those arrangements. Continuing the point about um, mitigation methods or measures in respect of our environment, in Tobago, we um, immediately when we came to office, we started a voluntary program of um, getting rid of our plastics and styrofoam. And, and that is working. We started by ensuring that the divisions of the Tobago House of Assembly became compliant. Um, we are aware that pending legislation um, to treat with that at the national parliament level is, is on the way. And we are eagerly looking forward to that because these this tremendous amount of plastic, as you know, can impact our seas and our oceans, and thereby reducing the viability of our fishing stocks and, um, and so on. We also are at the point of developing a recycling depot in Tobago. It's a joint arrangement. It has been spearheaded by the, um, Inter uh, the Institute of Marine Affairs. So it's a joint arrangement between the Institute of Marine Affairs, the Tobago House of Assembly, and um, a private entity, private operator, where we seeking to, under the rubric of iCare program, treat with the number of plastics and so on that um, we utilize on a daily basis, with the hope being that those will be shipped abroad and then turn into materials that are then reusable, for example, in the making of um, bottle corks and, and, and so on. So we are engaged in that activity as part of mitigating those ill effects of these um, plastics and so on. Recently as well, when we came to office, um, we facilitated the arrangement in Tobago um, among the Tobago House of Assembly, mm -hmm. the Ministry of um, Public Utilities, and the Mount Pleasant Credit Union to provide a space for the development of um, a 
with water facility in southwestern Tobago. That is complete, and therefore what that does is that it allows for the treatment of our waste, um, solid and otherwise, um, in a way that prevents that kind of waste getting into our seas and oceans, and of course our aquifers and, 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 and the like. And that was a tremendous achievement as we seek to um, raise our standards of um, environmental sustainability. I could add as well that consistent with our tourism thrust, we are seeking blue flag certification for two beaches in Tobago. As you know, that kind of certification is internationally recognized and it speaks to the whole issue of maintaining your beaches at a particular standard because we are into the whole issue of an eco-friendly environment. As a matter of fact, we, would, we did rebrand our tourism um, effort. We're now talking about Tobago Beyond Ordinary because we are saying we need to lift our game to the point where um, excellence becomes the hallmark of our operations. In that, in that regard, we talk about 101 reasons for visiting uh, Tobago, which seeks to take note of our biodiversity, our tremendous ecosystem, our culture, our history. Big, as you may know, um, Tobago has always been the gem of the Caribbean. Um, the colonials have uh, fought over us. Oh, no, the, Charles. Uh, you mean I've used up so much time? <laughs> and I was now getting war warmed up. But, but, <laughs> but, 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 but that in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, is what we are doing in Tobago as we seek to exploit this emerging concept of a blue economy. Thank you. Thank you. They're wonderful remarks. And we, and we all know, I mean, uh, we're pretty much aware of the, all the rich culture. And also, I mean, besides the ecosystem services, mm -hmm. you know that Blue Economy mm -hmm. uh, um, joins or tries to work together both the ecosystem services and the cultural services. That probably is going to be, if we have time, the, the next round of, uh, of uh, Q&A. And um, um, as... Uh, as, as, as the minister just mentioned, and, and you as well, uh, of course, that uh, coastal, I mean, coastal protection, uh, flood control, and uh, runoff drainage management are key issues in order to guarantee an effective land use and also an, an effective and optimal um, sustainable seascape uh, management. In this, um, but also, I mean, we need to keep in mind that the first line of defense to coastal protection are the um, conservation of mangroves, the protection of uh, coral reefs, and also the seagrass. Once you try to complete or you complete these uh, these uh, prevention measures, you probably are going to save quite a bit of resources. In order, I mean, to keep a sound, a sound uh, uh, land use uh, practices and. Uh, and, and overall the, the, the seascape. And, and that's great, and I think, uh, sorry, uh, uh, that uh, we're, we're, I mean, we're certain that uh, that flood control is, uh, is, uh, is key, and it's gonna be very useful, and it's gonna recover and, and try and, and guarantee all the, I mean, to, to, uh, to the 80% <laughs> of the population who lives in this area, and guarantee all this, and, 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 and we congratulate you to, I mean, to, uh, to, uh, to, to get engaged in this, uh, in this endeavor. Let me just add to uh, your point on the environment. We do have in Trinidad a very vigorous environment management authority. Any project that is being done on the coast or has anything to do with the environment, we have to get the relevant certifications. So rest assured that we do protect the natural environment. We cannot embark on a program until we secure the mangroves and all our projects have to be environmentally friendly. And that is why we're trying to do some of the coastal projects tied into the tourism trust because we see ecotourism as a major tourism trust going forward. 
all our projects have to be in line with the environmental uh, policies. That's great. And, 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 and also, I mean, uh, I think, uh, um, I mean, we're pretty certain of this and, 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 and we witness, I mean, you com uh, your commitment to, to uh, I mean, to, um, to a sound uh, social and environmental management in your projects. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, and the next, our, our next guest, uh, Ms. Gole, uh, you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, all protocols observed, recognizing, of course, the Minister of Finance and other distinguished guests and, of course, our panelists. So I wanted to just start by talking a little bit about CRIF, which is the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance uh, Facility. It was established in 2004 after the passage of Hurricane Ivan, which, as some of us may recall, devastated Grenada, Cayman, just creating at least 200% of GDP in terms of losses and damage. And, and CRIF was really formed uh, as the Caribbean's response uh, to develop a, a financial instrument to uh, reduce the impact of natural disasters. So uh, today, it, it still is, and it's, it was the first multi-country risk pool backed by the traditional reinsurance markets and capital markets. Um, today, we have 22 members, 19 Caribbean countries, and three Central American countries, and we provide um, parametric insurance coverage for, and this is two sovereigns, to governments, uh, who ordinarily would not be able to have access to insurance on their own. And if even in the cases where that occurs, it's about relatively twice the price as, as what CRIF would offer. But the products we cover, the products are geared to uh, earthquakes, tropical cyclones, uh, excess rainfall and fisheries. And I think, um, you know, I really have to recognize the fact that Trinidad and Tobago was involved from the start and was part of that discussion and innovation to create this kind of facility. And, you know, CRIF today is really based on providing quick, li quick liquidity. So the payouts, which are made 14 days after the events, would um, really be within, you know, the size of, of payouts that are really for emergency response. So I think even, you know, dealing with the Ministry of Finance and the agencies here, a lot of the discussion is how do we, how can we really move the products to providing coverage that's, you know, more, more, um, I suppose, relevant to, to the size of losses that we're seeing? Because as the point was made today, climate change is real. We're experiencing it. We're experiencing it and we all feel it. But in terms of CRIF and, and the blue economy, it's a very exciting topic. There's a lot of innovation and collaboration that's happening in the background um, that's involving donors, governments, the private sector. And in the context of the Caribbean, it's really important, and not just Trinidad, but especially Tobago, um, many of the countries and small island developing states globally, uh, it's the about 90% of the GDP would be generated along coastlines and about 60% of the population would really live within five, five kilometers of the coast. So this is why it's of great relevance for governments to really recognize the strategic importance of of the health and vitality of coastlines and to put measures in place uh, to really, you know, consider the growth aspects and, and use the opportunities of this blue economy in terms of uh, advancing sustainable prosperity for all. Now, you know, it, it's known as well that in the Caribbean, there are special economic zones of the oceans around that make up in many cases more than the actual landmass of the, um, of the, of the country. And there are a lot of new areas to be explored. I mean, it's not limited to just tourism and fishing and, and um, you know, uh, logistics, uh, but a lot of new areas, uh, nutraceuticals, bio-based <laughs> industries. And, you know, as we explore opportunities for growth and investment, uh, this is one area, you know, that we can, we can definitely tap into for the, you know, the goals, the millennium goals, leaving no one behind, right? So, Again, coming back to the notion of the blue economy, and it really is one of the, the most significant opportunities. You know, giving, giving it this name, makes it actually makes a difference. Uh, 
it is really encompassing sustainable management and the proper use of resources. It is it, it helps to optimize uh, social and eco economic decisions uh, that will benefit us going into the future. And the World Bank in 2017 did a study on the blue economy. And it said that the growth, the growth in, within that space is tremendous. As a matter of fact, it's, it's targeted to double by 2030. But in the Caribbean, the actual growth prospects still today are relatively small. And that has to do with a lot of factors. Um, inadequate technology is one of them, a lack of awareness generally, um, a lack of investment. And I think these are some of the issues that we can touch on on the panel today. But really a lot of the countries haven't put forth or put in place coherent frameworks or investment plans around these opportunities. And I think it is important to fully characterize and recognize the opportunities. Uh, and again, I mean, a lot is happening. If you consider the plans that we hear about in Trinidad and Tobago, a lot is actually happening. And the minister and Senator made uh, comments on, on of some of those, but I just wanted to touch on a few other areas where you know, investment is really important. And one of those would be um, developing climate, climate smart fisheries management plans and increasing the awareness around, you know, these issues for fisher folk. It's important to have the legislation in place. Fisheries legislation is becoming more and more important and, and um, in place in other Caribbean countries. But it's legislation that also focuses on, you know, food food security and sustainable livelihoods. Coral reef restoration programs, again, really very important. It's happening in, in a lot of the islands. It's in, in really critical for Trinidad and Tobago, I think. But you know, when we talk about planning, I think it's really important for us to start having discussions on quantifying the opportunities, right? So um, it's, it's easy, I think, in a sense, to quantify the value of well, the direct use value of like the, the actual fish in the water, but there's the indirect, you know, uses that need to be valued. For example, if you consider um, what they call genetic resources of reefs, uh, you know, there's so much research going on that I'm sure Dr. Egard will touch on that, you know, reefs could potentially hold the cure for many diseases. So, but quantifying it uh, is really a first step to making sustainable decisions and getting the kind of risk management and the type of investment that's that's really necessary. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, pollution and, and waste management, and waste management uh, is a priority. I mean, the need to, as far as possible, eliminate land-based uh, pollution is, is extremely important, and in particular, it's important for Trinidad and Tobago in terms of the manufacturing sector and also the energy sector. But, you know, building that awareness, I think, is, is still the first step to get people to understand the value of the green economy and the blue economy and the interconnectedness of it all um, and developing the partnerships that's necessary on the local, the regional and the global front, um, because this is what is really important for the knowledge transfer and the investment to translate into real growth for, for a country. So it's happening in other places. Uh, if you look at Jamaica, where actually their uh, exclusive economic zone is 20 times the size of the landmass in Jamaica, they have established uh, an entire organizational structure called the Special Economic Zone Authority, and it really fosters economic growth around the blue economy. It's happening in St. Lucia. If you look at the development of Castries, the 2030 vision, uh, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of discussion on how do they really tap in to all of the opportunities for the, for the, blue, uh, the blue economy in terms of planning. But, you know, it, from, from Chris's point of view, uh, we, we are interested in this topic uh, from the point of view of innovation and resilience. Uh, co the coastlines are very, very important to, to the Caribbean countries from the point of view of storm surge. So that's why a lot of work is being done. And I just, you know, as a case study in terms of how private sector and donors and governments are collaborating, this year we introduced a product, a fisheries product called Coast. And it's actually the first of its kind uh, 
worldwide. It's parametric insurance coverage. Uh, it's it's channeled through governments, through the Ministry of Finance, but the direct in that, the direct um, beneficiaries are, are Fisher Folk. So a lot of um, a lot of the backing and support came from the World Bank and the, the U.S. government for the actual development and the launch of this product. Two Caribbean countries purchased it for the first time this year. But what's exciting about it is that it's really a catalyst for resilience. So when countries purchase the policy, they actually agree to adopt certain best practices. Um, and also they would translate, or, or if a payout is triggered, it is the, the fisher folk that would actually be the beneficiaries. And the fisher folk also have to adopt certain best practices to be on the radar. They have to be registered. They have to be, you know, really, you know, uh, or, or understanding or, or getting the best practices in place, at, even at that micro level. So a lot is going on in, in terms of you know, moving insurance from the macro to the meso to the micro level. And again, um, this type of innovation is critical because, you know, the, the benefits of it is not just lives and livelihoods of fisher folks. It's actually protecting your reefs as well. It, that, that's another big area of innovation. We're looking at reef insurance, which right now for CRIF, it's a collaboration between NGOs, uh, donors, and and um, CRIF, and it is about developing a product that, uh, with the Nature Conservancy, which is an NGO that really promotes more resilience, healthier reefs, and that trans it, it, it translates to, to lower premiums on policies. So a lot of work, uh, I think, has to be recognized. Um, I think in terms of donor support, we have to recognize the work that has, is being done by the, the World Bank, the, the IDB, CAF. There are a lot of players that actually have this conversation alive. It's not like even five years ago when you talk about disaster risk management or protecting coastlines. This is really an active, active conversation. And, you know, the, the Caribbean, you know, is really almost at the forefront. And it's something to be extremely proud of. As a region, we talk about being the first climate, climate smart zone. There is a lot of work and results that are coming out from these discussions. And, you know, just, uh, just uh, to touch on two points that I thought were just so inspiring this morning in, in the, the previous session. Dr. Egod made the, the comment, if you create the, the conditions, the best will rise up. And it's true because there's a lot happening on the ground. But with that awareness and with, you know, you know, the right partnerships, we can move from these, these ideas being just conceptual to real projects with real financing and real results. And another point this morning that was made was, you know, if you don't insert yourself into, into you know, this new economy, it's like being disconnected from the internet because, you know, the opportunity is huge and it is, I, it is really important to create that chain, you know, and 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 really um, have you know tangible results from discussions like this. So, just that's just a bit on on you know CRIF and a bit on the innovation side and resilience resilience side with respect to the blue economy. So, I look forward to your questions as well. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks to you, really. <laughs> very valuable insights and and um, i think something very important that you mentioned is that when we talk about blue economy we're not only talking about challenges we're talking about opportunities mm -hmm. and at, and also at the same time that we're building a, our I communities resilient to to uh, to climate change we did it we need i mean there's a need of innovation so we uh, so this community this the seascape could uh, have better access to markets to technology and um, and also to finance, and I think that's quite a quite a challenge, not, uh, quite a challenge not only for Trinidad Tobago com mm -hmm. co community, but for everybody. We try. I mean, we are trying, and we are committed to work in the in the region. Thank you. Uh, um, next is uh, Professor Agara, which was was uh, going to share with us the his insights. I think. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, thank thank you very much. Uh, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, honorable ministers, um, 
I've been asked to talk for a few minutes about the assessment of risk and opportunities and the role of research and innovation. So, so let, me, let me start off by just giving you a quick perspective before we get to particular um, opportunities that we have with regard to the blue economy. Um, I think, as you, you all know very well, Trinidad Trin and Tobago is an archipelagic state with an exclusive economic zone that has 15 times more marine than land area. I think you referred to Jamaica as having 20 times. But in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, it has 15 times more marine than land area. And I would say that I would regard um, the marine area as land that happens to be underwater. It's still land that happens to be underwater. And, our, um, and it's an area that's increasing because of um, climate change and sea level rise. Um, when we started to measure sea level rise 20-something um, years ago, the sea level rise in Trinidad and Tobago was about 1.6 millimeters per year. Now it is close to 3 millimeters per year. And, uh, and the consequences have already been outlined by, by the minister of the coastal erosion that's taking place. Um, many people don't know that uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, there's a sea level rise monitor in the Port Spain Harbor. There's one in Point Forte, there's one in um, uh, Galeota on the East Coast, and there's one in Scarborough in Tobago in the harbor. And that data is uploaded to a satellite every few minutes. So we're not guessing. We know exactly what the sea level rise is in Trinidad and Tobago, and the rate is increasing with consequences that have already been outlined by previous speakers. Um, so that, that much larger marine areas, 15 times more, which is increasing, contains significant ocean resources that can be exploited sustainably to generate economic wealth and diversify through expanding what we're referring to now as the blue economy. Um, Further, as has been outlined earlier, um, like I just all of the islands in the Caribbean, the majority of Trinidad and Tobago's population is located in coastal cities, such as Chagonas, according to the last sentence, its largest expanding uh, area, which is on the coast, Port of Spain, San Fernando, Point Forte, and Scarborough. In fact, so, so um, we are an island, and most of the population is living on the, on the coast. Uh, and dealing with the consequences and largely dependent on the blue economy. So this idea of blue economy development is quite important. Um, the, so let me just start so that we come to a common understanding of what we refer to as a blue economy, because we, before we started the session, there was a, during the break, there was a little conversation about the understanding of the blue economy. And I would say, um, for those who don't know, that the first time this term was mentioned was in a book by Gunther Pauli, who, who, who mentioned this term. Um, people, of course, before that knew about marine environment and fisheries and so forth. But the idea was that this uh, idea of a blue economy is a source of economic wealth and can provide jobs and so forth. So he attached on the bare fact that we have a marine environment onto economic development. Um, just to so what, what he described up to recently was a, creating a sustainable ocean economy whose, and I will quote, whose economic activities in balance with the long-term capacity of ocean ecosystems to support this activity and remain resilient and healthy. So if we're generating wealth out of the blue, blue economy, it doesn't make any sense for us to ruin, you know, the natural capital that we have, as has been outlined uh, earlier. We, we have to make it resilient and keep it healthy, as the previous speakers have mentioned. Um, so part of the risk, because I asked to mention about risk, the, the, the part of the risk that the blue economy um, is that the blue economy is developed within the current linear business model. Uh, the current um, business model is linear. It's a take, make, buy, sell, and throw away with consequences when you're on a small island about, you know, uh, you, you talk about uh, areas where you're ending up with landfills with more and more rubbish and you have a problem because you're on a small island. So part of the, the discussion going forward 
is um, to change the model a little bit going forward to introduce what is referred to as a circular economy aspect. That is to talk about uh, the blue economy and to make, use, remake, reuse, and recycle, to try and design things so that you don't end up with waste being thrown away, but that you try to design it from the outset to be remade into something else, to keep going round, a circular economy. So that's one of the ideas that I put to you, that we should try where possible um, to, to look at that aspect as well. Um, th that approach, for example, includes, you know, uh, promoting renewable ocean energy, aquaculture, sustainable fisheries, marine biotechnology, uh, biological systems of recover technical waste as a source to be remade into new products and so forth. Some of those ideas have already been mentioned. Um, this also includes new re renewable energy projects such as solar and wind and ocean technologies. From the point of view of Trinidad and Tobago, I would say Trinidad and Tobago needs to change its thinking from being regarding itself as, you know, it's great that it's one of the two small island developing states that, in the world that are net exporters of energy. It's really Trinidad and Tobago and Bahrain. Okay? Um, it has to think of itself as an exporter of energy. It happens to come mainly from oil and gas at the moment, but even when in whenever that declines, that it still exports energy. And the way to do that is that there is an amazing ocean space that can generate energy, okay? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Renewable energy, solar, wind, ocean technologies like tidal, thermal, wave energy, and so forth. And groundbreaking technologies that I'll mention a little bit about earlier, like ocean thermal energy conversion and seawater air conditioning and so forth. Um, and those projects are motivated by protecting marine ecosystems, by extracting resources that are value in a sustainable manner that allows for regeneration or restoration. So let me just talk about some of the um, main blue uh, economy characteristics uh, identified. Uh, we had an earlier discussion about basic infrastructure. So, Trinidad's basic infrastructure also includes municipal solid waste, recycling, drinking water, uh, and wastewater services. And all of those need to be analyzed to determine if, if infrastructure could be retrofitted to aid in the transition to blue and circular economy. And some of that has already been, uh, been mentioned, is already on the way in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so, economic growth. So, let me get to the critical part, which is the economic growth opportunities. Now, as has been mentioned earlier, Trinidad and Tobago has one of the three highest GDPs per capita in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I would say that it's a very good position to begin new investments in the transition to the blue and possibly circular economy. It really has no excuse. It has really uh, good infrastructure and it has amazing opportunities. So let me talk about the first one which is the ocean energy, okay? Um, we, we keep mentioning energy over and over, but Trinidad and Tobago is in a, a, a very amazing position. That is because it has an existing offshore oil and gas uh, expertise and rigs and so forth, okay? Um, at the moment, it's thinking you know, oil and gas rigs, you know, you're taking oil and gas by, by drilling a well and so forth. But the fact that you have infrastructure that allows you to operate expertise that, world, that is world class means that you could also generate um, you know, energy from a rig by putting a windmill on it. You have, you're also in Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, you're on the continental shelf. So it is much shallower than islands down the Caribbean where it's very, water is right off, so it's very deep. So you're in a position to actually install wind farms on the coast, in the sea, in fact, as has been done in other places as well. And you have, um, you know, uh, one of the highest um, rates of engineers in the world per capita, okay? That's what the UN told me. Trinidad and Tobago is like a developed country with regard to engineers. That's a problem in, in many small island developing states, but Trinidad and Tobago is well advanced and is, is, is has a, 
a ratio of engineers to, to, to population that is a developed country level, okay? That's in the UN statistics as well. So it's in a position to really exploit opportunities. It could develop wind farms. Let me just tell you that off the east coast of Trinidad and Tobago, um, there's nothing between here and the coast of Africa. The wind speeds are enormous coming across the Atlantic, okay, in our directions. And we could generate uh, uh, energy by putting a wind farm, for example. We, we also, uh, off of, of Trinidad and Tobago, passing around Trinidad and Tobago, is a little bit more than 20% of the world's um, total freshwater input into the oceans. Water coming out of the Amazon and the Orinoco comes along the coast of South America, passes along the east coast of Trinidad and Tobago and turns ar around uh, Tobago. And those currents actually can be used to generate energy as well. Uh, you know, um, all, of, all of the technology to do that, of putting turbines in the water so that the strong currents cause them to turn and generate energy, all of that is already, uh, already developed, okay? So I'm just saying, if Trinidad and Tobago turns this thinking that it's all dependent on oil and gas, to saying that, no, we can generate energy and we could export energy as well, in fact. And we have all of the capabilities, the technical capabilities uh, to do that. So we need to think a little bit uh, differently. Um, now, further, I should say, maybe it's a bad thing to say, Trinidad and Tobago has an amazing um, impetus to replace oil and gas use to generate electricity by generating it from renewables. That is, once you replace using fossil fuels to generate energy in Trinidad and Tobago, you'll have more gas available, which you could feed to the petrochemical sector. This is a really rather unique <laughs> perspective from a Trinidad and Tobago <laughs> point of view. Um, that does not exist in any other country. It is unique to Trinidad and Tobago that, you know, we keep here talking about, we, you know, probable and proven reserves and so forth. But um, if you don't use the fossil fuels to generate energy, you will have more of it available to feed into the petrochemical sector. So that, that's, that's a big impetus for Trinidad and Tobago. Now, if Trinidad and Tobago increases its ambition level, it could also look at the feasibility of implementing more innovative renewable options, including ocean, ocean thermal energy conversion, OTEC. That was first developed and is in use in Hawaii. That technology is well developed. Um, but the condition is that you need to have um, cold, very, very cold water uh, um, available offshore. Um, and I think that that really is only available close to Tobago, uh, in fact, okay? So um, it's one of the things, for example, I'm told that Barbados is considering this OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, and also seawater air conditioning, called SWAC, seawater air conditioning, um, for hotels. That is, when you have cold water offshore, okay, you tip, bring the water up and you pass it through the air conditioning in hotels, uh, in fact, to, to cool. It's a lot, you know, less expensive than using uh, energy, paying for energy, in fact. So um, that's SWAC technology. These are some of the, the new innovative technologies that are well developed and available um, and possibly might be of more interest to Tobago. Um, let me carry on with the blue economy possibilities. Ecosystem and restoration services, very important. Projects that work to strengthen coastal and marine ecosystems and, and natural capital have various benefits for Trinidad and Tobago that can go beyond protecting natural ecosystems because we also want to make money. Bolstering ecosystems and contributing to restoration services could have major impacts, especially for Tobago, whose economy is largely relies on natural habitats for food, tourism, protection against environmental threats and industry. Um, from climate change, as you all know, coral reefs are suffering damages um, due to acidification and increased temperatures of ocean water. And there have been coral bleaching in Tobago reported continuously. 
Coral conservation efforts are being carried out to save reefs and help protect marine habitats. By protecting coral habitats, Trinidad and Tobago is also protecting fishing and tourist industries, as Chief Secretary has outlined, that rely on meat, marine health to attract ecotourists. And I think Tobago in particular is promoting itself as an ecotourist destination. Okay? So people, you, you, you heard about getting certification for beaches and so forth. You don't want people to come on expense, to think in cold places, they dream about going to Tobago and being on beaches and sipping pina coladas, and you tell them, come there and pay money, okay? Um, and you, you, you want to promote that. They don't want to go in a, and bathe in the water, which is, you know, being affected by sewage, for example. So the certification is important to go in the ecotourist di di direction. Um, other co activities that could contribute to ecosystem resilience include working on protecting endangered flora and fauna species. Ocean cleanup, we heard all about the plastics, and protecting coastal blue carbon habitats. So let me say a little bit about the blue carbon habitats, because this is focusing on mangrove restoration and conservation. Mangrove swamps have the highest rate of carbon sequestration of any ecosystem on the planet. Okay? Um, now, one of the interesting things is that everybody's very, very um, concerned about a carbon footprint. So that once you, trees take carbon dioxide out of the air, which is the problem creating climate change, and they sequester it in wood, and in the case of mangroves, when the, the wood decays and so forth, because it's anoxic, it gets locked in. So the highest rate of carbon sequestration occurs in mangrove areas. And remarkably, there are um, markets around the world in which people buy carbon. You could purchase carbon in a protected area uh, to offset, say, your flight here from abroad. When you've bought your airline tickets, most airlines have an option that if you wish to purchase some trees in a protected area, to offset the carbon that was generated by your flight here, you could do that. Or uh, many countries, many com countries around the world, if you want to create a new company and it's going to put carbon dioxide into the air, for example, in Germany, they say that you will have to purchase um, carbon dioxide sequestration. They usually do that in some tropical place, okay? So that your net carbon footprint will be neutral facts, for example, some big companies like Apple are doing that. They're purchasing carbon sequestration in mangroves in Colombia, for example. Okay? So I'm just saying, if we measure the carbon, it can be sold. And there are eight markets around the world. If you go on Google, you can see any day what carbon is being sold for, bought for in China, in California, in Europe, and so forth. Okay? So I'm just saying, restoration also produces an opportunity to bring in money and to employ people and so forth. It's a business aspect, an economic aspect. It's not just about protecting the environment. That's one of the things that we need uh, to pursue. And it's also mentioned in the Paris Agreement, okay, which has been ratified by Trinidad and Tobago. Article 5 states that it encourages, encourages uh, reforestation in order to sequester carbon. So I'm just saying... Um, these are some of the things that we need to be uh, doing. So I just want to mention, before I move on to the, the next part and, and, and round up, um, Trinidad and Tobago could in fact develop what is referred to internationally as a payment for ecosystem services. Uh, you know, to, put, to pay people in communities to do work to enhance natural capital. Um, and... We also have a green fund in Trinidad and Tobago. And some aspects of that could be created into payment for ecosystem services to mobilize people in communities to protect, uh, to protect the environment and create new assets. So I'm told that, and that green fund is managed by the Ministry of Planning and Development and the Ministry of Finance, in fact. Um, so it could be used to mobilize communities rather widely uh, to restore the environment and enhance natural capital. I'm told by the central bank, I think the governor is still here, that um, the research division is working on a paper for the prime minister on developing a natural capital accounting system for Trinidad and Tobago. Very good thing. 
that it's not only about dollars and cents. There's other forms of wealth and natural capital. So I'm told that has been worked on by the central bank. So, okay, so let me just mention some things that already are mentioned. I'll go quickly. Climate change resilient ecotourism. Tourism is the economic activity that has the fastest potential to develop, especially in Tobago, um, with regard to nature, to promoting nature-based tourism. Uh, within this context, delivering a sustainable blue economy in Trinidad and Tobago is closely aligned with the promotion of sustainable tourism. That is, providing a combination of nature tourism and sustainable tourism, which taps into natural capital and applies restorative circular economy business models and systems to produce products and service, materials recovery, clean energy, and clean water are the, are the are aspects related. Um, another area of the blue economy is sustainable fisheries and harvesting of living resources. Well, I need to wrap up. Okay. For, uh, um, so the, um, one of the things that could be explored are opportunities for things like shrimp aquaculture, um, creating uh, fish processing, which includes using waste to, um, to produce fish batter, fish bread, high protein supplements and so forth. And I, I, would, I would close off by talking a little bit about amazing opportunity that's occurred. You know, in the region, there's a lot of problems with sargassum and beaches. Um, sargassum, you can cl clean up beaches because it affects tourists, but sargassum can be converted into fertilizers. Um, people have developed um, cosmetics out of sargassum. And at UWE, um, they have developed bioplastics that look no different from ordinary plastics. The bioplastics will be, if you plant it in the ground, will degrade within weeks, okay, and being converted into fertilizer. And um, those students are working with two companies in Trinidad and Tobago developing products. Excuse me, Dr. Rager, we need yeah. to wrap up. Right. So we need to okay. Okay. So That's I'm, being I'm, great and yes. comprehensive. So I'm just saying that this idea about blue economy is an amazing opportunity to develop economic aspects out of the uh, environment. Okay, that's the last thing I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Excuse me. Thank you very much, Dr. Egan. Um, let's move on to the, I mean, to the final part of this uh, of this session. Um, we, I mean, we know. I mean, now that we know, and uh, we're pretty much aware with all this data valuable data that uh, all the possibilities that Blue Economy has in Trinidad and Tobago. And, um, and the next question always is being implementation. Mm -hmm. How we can go through and make all these possibilities and opportunities real and the benefit of the livelihoods of the population. So every time you think about implementation, you're, I mean, you have in mind the uh, alliances, the how you're going to build alliances. I mean, you have several arrangements. For example, you have the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. You have the, the 14, which deals pretty much with ocean and coastal protection. Mm -hmm. You have the Samoa Pathway for small islands and the climate change resilience. It's pretty strong, and you are also in there. Uh, um, we are talking right now about the 2020-2015 biodiversity goals for uh, the next generation of biodiversity goals. And um, so, and internally in the, in the country, you have different plans, programs, which, I mean, which all are addressed to, to, to deal with climate change adaptation, which is very important you know, when we talk about resilience. And, um, and at the same time, you build alliances uh, you have to think about uh, finance and access to finance. And blue economy is quite useful in this area because you have the whole principles of sustainable development. I mean, uh, the effective uh, uh, protection of nature, the sustainable use of natural resources, and the sound uh, social inclusion. But on in the same side, you have the three different stages for uh, green or blue finance, as, mm -hmm. as it's mentioned. Uh, Dr. Egger before, uh, in which in the first stage you have, uh, I mean, when you uh, have eligibility parameters to, to, uh, for, 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 your, for your investment projects. And I think the top of the list are the ones that Minister uh, Sinan and Stolen about uh, uh, flood control and uh, runoff drainage, I think. 
and all projects involved in, in reforestation and in, uh, in coastal uh, in coastal control are pretty, are pretty much in this line. The second stage is when uh, is when you uh, I mean when you decide this responsibility with uh, with environment with social and environmental safeguards and and um, and performance. And I think as you already said, Minister, you're you have already completed this this, uh, this stage. And the third one is when you put in value all this performance and all and, and all this outcome and uh, and outputs that you develop in the in your in your day-to-day -day management. And it's when uh, and, and it's when you have access to green or blue financing, and this can uh, loans and insurance, uh, it's, uh, etc. So. Um, uh, I think it's important, I mean, um, in, in this uh, uh, very, I mean, rich combination of backgrounds of the panel, how do you think about the opportunities also that uh, in Trinidad Tobago you see towards implementation of blue economy? And uh, please, uh, uh, Honourable Minister, please the floor. Um, let me... Let me just thank the members of CAP for giving us as a country the opportunity to deal with our flooding problem. Very recently, I met with the, the team from CAP and as a country, we had about four or five different plans that we spent a lot of money to develop in terms of how we deal with our flooding <laughs> program. We had the Nariva Basin study, the Oropooch Basin, we did a lot of studies. Unfortunately, there were no workable plan. So we spent money on these plans and then implementation was never part of the program. And I just want to compliment and thank CAF for coming on board and not actually volunteering to give us a loan to do another study of how to implement it. But they actually worked with us, brought in the experts. They are coming up with the operational plan for us and creating a format where we can do short-term, medium, and long-term plan as a country of how we deal with flooding. Um, and they also agreed to fund that program for us. So I just want to use just my final words to, to thank CAF for giving us that sort of support at this point in time where I identified in terms of infrastructure, flooding, and coastal erosions as two of our major projects. I would just want to close by, again, thanking CAF for all the support that they have given to us as a country. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you much. And over Charles, I... Uh... For us in Tobago, exploiting the blue economy is critical to the development efforts in Tobago, particularly in the area of um, tourism. Um, because we are severely impacted by coastal erosion and rising sea levels, as we would have heard. Now, on Wednesday, we facilitate a conversation with CAF um, geared towards streamlining the plans for the loan application. For us in Tobago, therefore, it is really the urgency of now, because I did indicate that we just seven and a half miles wide. Um, so that we really are almost in a state, if we were patient, we would have been heading to the ICU. Mm -hmm. And in that context, therefore, um, we would wish that CAF would expedite the arranged ones so as to facilitate those developmental efforts through your funding. <laughs> Thank you. I need, I need some water before. <laughs> um, thank you, Nora Charles. And it, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, Ms. Gola, please. Just two comments. We really want to see a lot of focus on the fishery sector and on uh, reef renewal restoration programs. These are things that affect, you know, the most vulnerable in our community and there's certainly a lot of work to be done to support at that level as well. Uh, in terms of the bigger projects, I mean, there's a whole list of opportunities. They're not that really far away as, I mean, Dr. Egod brought them to life. They're not that far into the future. It's really about finding the correct, um, you know, risk financing 
you know, instruments. All of these, you know, projects have to be done on a really sustainable uh, basis. And I just wanted to make the point that in the context of climate change, disasters management in any of these projects as we go forward is absolutely critical, right? So it's an opportunity for us as a country to, to really put best practices in, in place from the start of a new focus on a new, new sector. So getting, you know, all the instruments, the financing tools involved um, to really, you know, uh, uh, properly finance these, create sustainable investment and, and development will, will be critical. Yes, indeed. I think Trinidad Tobago has an extraordinary opportunity in order to mm -hmm. apply with all these uh, green or blue financial tools that are in play right now. Dr. Rigat, please. Yeah, so I think we need to go from evidence to action, if I could summarize it. Um, lots of studies has been outlined, um, and we are a very tolerant society. Um, we create plans, and in order to bring about transformative change, I think it's important that we take from, go from policy into action, and we enforce laws, and we don't incentivize things that are wrong, and de-incentivize things that we want people to do. That's part of the problem. We, we allow everybody to do whatever they want. Free society, you know, you could destroy the environment, you could pollute, you could do all kinds of things. And I think we're really um, too tolerant. If I could end in saying that um, I, my, my thinking was changed by being in Singapore. You know, I think Singapore is, can't be described I don't want to say it in a bad way, as a benevolent dictatorship, if you will, okay, where you, you could form a company in Singapore within a week of arriving. Um, you, 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 know, you, you can order your passport and have it delivered to your house online. In fact, things talk about digitization and so forth. Um, but they don't allow everybody to do exactly what they want. They make everybody conform to the plan. And I mean, we, I think we need some aspect of that as well, rather than a, allowing a free-for-all and then we're not making progress at the rate that we should. Thanks very much. It's interesting. Yeah, it's a paradox. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I think we have time for a, a two questions from the floor. I don't know if we can take those. And I don't know if the mic is, would be available. Please. Just raise your hand. We're, we're, uh, we're going to take two. One there and the second one over there. Okay, we're going to take this on, only these two. These two questions. Thank you very please, much. And, and uh, please uh, identify yourself and, and, and also let us know to whom is addressed your question. Thank you. Indra Harak Singh from the University of the West Indies. I'm a renewable energy specialist and I'm really very happy to be part of this discussion. And happy that you have allowed the audience a little time for questions. Um, Professor Agard said a lot of what I wanted to say. Um, and I'm very happy for that. Uh, we work together, so he, he understands where I'm coming from. Um, what I would like to just add, the whole issue of the blue economy is so important for us in the Caribbean countries. And we have... Um, he, he mentioned the various technologies that are available. So for Trinidad and Tobago, we have a 10% target by 2021 of renewable energy. So if we are having so much difficulty meeting that target on land-based renewables, perhaps we need to start thinking about the marine renewable energy environment. Um, it's possible, and as Professor Egard mentioned, we have a history of oil and gas, we have platforms. Studies must be done to test the resources. So resource assessment must be done for all of them, for the OTEC, for the tidal, for the waves, wave heights and so on. We need to do all of that before we can actually embark on a, on a project. Um, but what I would like to suggest is two things. If we could allocate sensibly a percentage of that 10%, some part of that, for marine renewables, maybe it's a way to get started on our blue economy here for Trinidad and Tobago. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, I think we really need to dedicate some policy 
towards the renewable, towards the blue economy, sorry. So I think the policy development is extremely, extremely important. And I would just like to address Honorable Chief Secretary, Tobago is a beautiful nesting ground for some of these renewables, and I would love to talk with you after. Thank you much. Certainly. Thank you much. I would also, uh, well, I would, I I would also be happy just, to engage. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. We're going to take the second question. Please identify yourself and, and, and only the question and the, uh, to whom it's addressed. Thank you. I would, we would appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, David Simmons. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation here today. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. One, in the terms of the blue economy, um, it's a term that is new, but the whole issue of recognizing that the ocean sector has tremendous amount of development potential is something which came out of the Lord of Sea Convention, which was signed way back in 1992. And I say that because it's important to understand that having identified those resources coming out of the ocean sector, not much has been done from since in the 1990s to now to really develop that sector. And my worry is that as we now take on a new term, we'll lose some of the importance of how do we go about developing that whole sector. And that was captured to me by a question put forward by the minister when he indicated that um, the minister of finance was always asking him, you are um, using up most of the budget. And he's right, because what happens is that we spend a lot of money in terms of talking about developing infrastructure to meet needs that contribute very little in terms of what it gives back. So for instance, if we're talking about the infrastructure needed for, uh, to protect the coastline, are we doing it to protect the tourism industry? Because if we're doing it to protect tourism industry or to support the tourism industry, what we have to ask ourselves is what are we getting back out of the tourism okay. sector, right? Thanks. So I, I think when we're speaking about the blue economy, we need to, apart from just thinking about all the new technologies that are emerging and so on, let's think of what the areas in which they generate a lot of revenue and how do we extract that revenue instead of letting it go right back out. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. And then, uh, if I could just address please, the last please, point that, that, that he made. When we spoke about protecting the coastline and tying it back to the tourism industry, what we spoke about is creating the atmosphere that could promote the tourist industry. And we have, a, a, a like the Manselina Resort, where this resort was developed to protect the coastline, but it morphed into a major tourist attraction. So yes, we put out the resources to protect the industry, but we actually created a tourist industry and uh, a, a, an area where tourists will go to in the Mayaro area, where we're doing another revetment project. That Again, that started off as a simple revetment project to protect the coastline. But what we see happening there now is that we have a lot of people, a lot of tourists actually going down to that area because they have, they have so much to offer in that area. And they're actually converting now that revetment to a broadwalk. And you have people going there, they're looking at the birds, they're looking at self the mangroves. A simple thing like, like the mangrove, we have a lot of people going and taking advantage and trying to understand how this area was actually created. So it's about tying the infrastructure and trying to create an industry um, around the infrastructure. Thank, Thank you. you. Professor uh, Agar, please, do you, have, do you have a question there? to respond about the... About the mangroves. About the mangroves. Yes, well, I, I indicated earlier that, of course, the mangroves are a source of wealth uh, in, in many aspects because they produce, you know, ecosystem services that support people and so forth. Um, that, that is also something in which you can also even develop ecotourism and taking people on trips and yeah. so forth. They like to hear about that and are prepared to pay money. And, and, and that is what okay. is actually happening in the area now, because you create the infrastructure, you create the atmosphere, and you actually have people going to look at these mangroves, and they're fascinated the way the mangrove actually spreads out and the amount of um, the marine life that actually lives yes. in the mangrove. Great. When uh, the time's up, uh, then uh, thank you very much to the uh, to our, uh, to our panel. I think the the, the presentations and uh, and the answers to the to the floor being uh, so enlightening and, and we all have the chance to, to learn from you. Thank you very much and, and thank you to the, uh, to the organizers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.